Hey everybody, how you doing? I hope you're having a great day today. Um, today we're going to start covering chapter 10 in our lecture. So chapter 10 is muscles, skeletal muscles specifically, but we will mention cardiac and smooth a little bit. I'm going to break this presentation up into two separate presentations. That way you can have access to kind of the more important information um, a little bit more closer towards the beginning of the chapter, kind of the middle beginning of the chapter, and then second half of the chapter should have a little bit um, less difficult information. That way you can focus, you know, your, your, your listening a little bit better instead of having everything all in one uh, recording. So here, let's go ahead and let's start this. Don't forget muscle is one of our four main tissue types. We've got epi, CT, muscle, and nervous. So we've kind of, you know, already spent one of our chapters talking about tissues and really covering the epi and the CT. Now um, we're going to you know, and then we put it together in some of our last chapters talking about skin and then kind of talking about specifically bones with connective tissues. And now we're going to switch over and we're going to focus the rest of our semester on muscles and nervous system. This is our main chapter on muscles, and that's the reason this is uh, a test all by itself, is this is a difficult chapter. And I don't want to try to bury you with this information by adding it to something else, because this is really our first hardest kind of chapter in this semester. So muscle tissue, don't forget that its main function is to contract and produce movement. And so some of that movement can um, produce different types of reactions. So it propels food, expels waste, changes the amount of air in the lungs, pumps blood. So these are things that a lot of times we don't think about. You know, a lot of times whenever we think about movement, we just think about moving our body around in our environment and in our surroundings. And there's a lot that's going on internally, right, as far as our movements. So we know that we have... Um, a lot of different muscles in the body. I don't really necessarily care that you know that there's 700. There's actually a little bit more, um, but you know it does make up a lot of our of a lot of our overall weight. And there are three types of muscle. And so this is very important that we reiterate that there's three types. There's skeletal muscle. Remember, skeletal muscle connects to the bones. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. It's involved with pumping blood. And smooth muscle is anything else. If it's not moving your bones, moving your body, if it's not pumping blood, and it's still doing some sort of movement in our body, then it's a smooth muscle. So we talked about erector pili muscles in the skin. Um, we're going to talk about in blood vessels for vasoconstriction and vasodilation, you know, in any respiratory vessel as well. If you have an allergy, you're familiar with vaso or bronchoconstriction, how it kind of constricts. So, Again, smooth muscle, wall of tubes, controls flow, right? So this whole chapter really focuses more on skeletal muscle. And so here we kind of see it switches over to skeletal muscle. The whole chapter is going to focus on skeletal muscle. And at the very, very end of the chapter, I've got just a handful of slides, you know, five minutes on each, um, cardiac and smooth. So let's dive into skeletal muscle and start talking about some of its um, characteristics. First off, the functions of, of skeletal muscle. The first one is body movement, right? So it connects to the bones, and when the muscles pull on the bones, it changes that leverage, and therefore we create movement overall. So body movement, that's kind of the main thing that we usually think about. Something that we don't think about is maintaining posture. Now this isn't necessarily talking about sitting upright versus slouching. What I'm really talking about is your head, for example, right? The head to remain upright, okay? If all muscles of the neck relax and your head just flops around, it just kind of rolls around in a circle, right? But the muscles in the neck, some of them are always active, and so they're providing your posture. They're providing the head to stand upright on your shoulders all the time, right? So that's sometimes why whenever you lay down at night, your neck is kind of sore. It's because these muscles are always active, right? They, here they talk about stabilizing joints and helps with the body's posture. But I like to think about your head as, as a good example of what posture really means, right? Protection and support. Muscles can provide a barrier like in your abdominal wall. So your abs help to protect your um, your guts and also the floor of your pelvic cavity. So the pelvic floor um, is also muscular and it kind of supports all the internal organs above it, right? So it protects and supports. Storage and movement of materials. This is a little bit more smooth muscle. A lot of smooth muscles are sphincters. We have a couple of smooth muscles like the anal sphincters and the um, 
the oral sphincter, which is your mouth, right? Orbicularis oris. And so those are types of sphincters that are skeletal muscles. Anytime we use the term sphincter, we're talking about a circular muscle. <clears throat> These guys are going to open and close to control passage through uh, uh, into something, out of something, right? So through our digestive tract, we see a lot of sphincters. Um, there at the end, we mentioned the anal sphincters. You control in order to release the voluntary, expel the feces. And so um, a lot of these are more smooth muscle, but they're listed as a function of skeletal. So I, let's don't get too much into these kind of concept here. Let's keep it with smooth. Heat production. A lot of people don't think about this, but muscles are always active. You know, like I said, you know, some of our posture muscles are always pulling. We just don't realize that. And so they're always burning energy. Muscles are very metabolic. And so as a result, whenever we burn energy, it's just a law of thermodynamics that energy can't be created nor destroyed. We can only change forms. That's the second law. And the third law states that when we change forms, we lose some of that energy in the form of heat. So heat is in efficiency in the long run and so our muscles converting ATP into kinetic energy we actually lose about 40% of the of the energy we create in the form of heat and so this heat's important though this is what creates our body temperature so 98.6 is the balance that our muscles create and then our hypothalamus sets that thermostat and we try to thermoregulate around it okay but this is the main source of our heat are our muscles now some characteristics what makes skeletal muscles a little bit different than everything else this is a unique characteristic excitability also conductivity these are two things that we're about to talk about with our nervous system so this this is two characteristics that our skeletal muscles actually share with our nervous system the first term is excitable excitable means that it can be stimulated by our nervous system okay if it's excitable then our nerves our neurons can end at these guys and they can trigger them to do something to make changes so excitability muscle cells are excitable they can be triggered by the nervous system not only are they excitable but they can pass that excitation right we know that the excitation in the nervous system is called an action potential so not only can they be stimulated by an action potential but now they can actually conduct that action potential down their plasma membrane and so this is important this is how we're gonna send that signal towards the inside of the cell so that we can stimulate all the components of this muscle at the same time to try to get it to contract right and that leads us to our third characteristic which is contractility contractility is simply just the ability that it can shorten and when it shortens it's going to produce movement right so contract always means to shorten right and so muscles don't lengthen to produce tension they shorten to produce tension and contractility is the term for that muscles are also elastic they contain a lot of elastic fiber so we can stretch that muscle um, and then whenever we finish stretching it it will kind of snap back to its original shape okay now this right here this is kind of not the truth okay um, muscle skeletal muscles can only pull they can't push so extensibility lengthening of a muscle cell is something that happens when a muscle cell relaxes but it can't produce tension and so this is not really what happens extension of the triceps brachii when the when you flex your elbow joint you extend it you make it longer but there's no tension made there and that's not involved with the contraction so this is very confusing I almost don't like to see that term as a characteristic I like elasticity a little bit better because it tells us that the muscle can stretch a little bit longer than usual and that's really kind of what this is saying as well okay so don't let that confuse you let's look at gross anatomy real quick right that's what we kind of do with things we start with the macro view and we build to our micro view so here macroscopically a skeletal muscle is composed of thousands of muscle cells and so our biceps for example is a muscle and it's composed of thousands hundreds of thousands possibly of these muscle cells now a muscle cell is also referred to and I know this is confusing a muscle cell is the same thing as a muscle fiber Okay, so a muscle cell and a muscle fiber are the same thing. When we were ancient anatomists, before our abilities to detect smaller structures came about, before we had microscopes, when we cut people open, it looked like muscles were made out of fibers. And so they didn't really know about these cells quite yet. So they started calling them muscle fibers first because they were just fibrous. They were the fibrous tissue in our body. And then 
whenever we got a little bit more educated, we learned that these are actually cells. So these are synonyms. Don't be confused by that. Okay. Now these muscle cells, these muscle fibers, they run the entire length of the muscle. So a cell is just as long as the whole muscle. That way, if the cell shortens or the fiber shortens, cell and fiber, same thing. If they shorten, then we're going to get a contraction. Okay, now we're going to take these fibers and we're going to bundle them together and kind of wrap them up, almost like with a little saran wrap, right? So we're going to wrap a series of these muscle fibers or cells up together, and we're going to call that bundle a fascicle. A fascicle is always a term for a bundle of something. We're going to see this same term in the nervous system when we bundle neurons together and their axons together, and we're going to create fascicles of neurons. So we bundle the cells and fibers together to create something called a fascicle. Fascicle. And then we bundle a whole bunch of fascicles together and we create the entire muscle. So I want you to look at this image. Let me go find it. I want you to look at this image. Here's an image from the textbook, figure 10.1. When we look at it here, this is your biceps. We can see the tendon coming down through the intertubercular groove, and then we kind of see the muscle forming. When we look at the whole muscle, we notice that it's made of these bundles of these muscle fibers or muscle cells. So each one of these little red tubes is one little muscle cell or muscle fiber. And when we bundle them together, then we get what's called a fascicle. So here we're pulling one fascicle out, there's another fascicle, here's another fascicle, and here's another fascicle, just a bundle of cells. When we bundle all the fascicles together, and that's when we make the whole muscle, right? So if you've ever cooked like pork, you know, you're trying to make barbecue in a crock pot or something, then you really start to see all these fascicles as the meat breaks down. It starts to break down into different chunks, and in between them you see a lot of times collagen or maybe some fat in between them. And so anytime you're looking at meat, you can kind of see some of these fascicles separating in that meat. Okay, sorry, not trying to make you stop eating meat, right? Now, let's go back. Sorry, I'm way back here. Okay, so here is where we just left off. I do want you to know that a skeletal muscle is composed of a few things. It's composed of these muscle cells or muscle fibers. And as I mentioned, it's also composed of connective tissue. Sometimes it's fat, sometimes it's just other connective tissue kind of holding those fascicles together. And then there's got to be blood vessels because, again, blood muscles are very metabolic, highly metabolic, so they need a lot of blood vessels. And because they're stimulated, they're excitable and conductive, then we need nerves. So these are the four things that make up a muscle. The cells or fibers, some, some CT, some blood vessels, and some nerves. Nothing too fancy. Let's look at the connective tissue. Okay, The connective tissue components, I just mentioned in my description of these muscles, something I said kind of like saran wrap. I said it kind of reminds you of saran wrap. It wraps around it when we're making a fascicle. So around the cells and around the fascicles and around the entire muscle, we're going to have some connective tissue layers. And again, it's kind of just like saran wrap layers, binding it together, holding these all together, and separating it from what's around it. Okay, These connective tissue layers are also kind of like a crawl space. It provides us a space for blood vessels and nerves to go through so that we can kind of have a routing area. Right? It protects that muscle. It's involved with attachment. We're going to find out that these connective tissue layers create tendons, and as a result, um, they're very important, right? So let's take a look. The first is called the epimysium, or some people say epimysium. The epimysium, epi, usually refers to the outer layer, so the epimysium surrounds the entire skeletal muscle. The paramysium surrounds each fascicle, and the endomysium is going to surround each individual muscle cell or muscle fiber. Okay, so again, let's take a look at our image to reinforce this. Here we see this kind of saran wrap layer around the outside of the whole muscle. That is the epimysium, and you kind of see that listed there. Here's a fascicle, and we can kind of see a layer that's surrounding that fascicle. There is that paramysium, and they're pointing that out right there. If we pull each one of these individual muscle cells out on the outside of its membrane, we have this outer connective tissue layer, and there they're pointing out that is the endomysium. So it's just a way that we organize and we bundle these, these cells and these tissues together. Now, as I mentioned, I want you to make sure that you know that at the end of the muscle, when the muscle cells stop,
the connective tissue layers keep going. And what they do is they form a bundle outside of the muscle cells or outside of the muscle fibers. So to me, it's always kind of like a piece of hard candy inside of a wrapper, right? The hard candy is the muscle. But when the muscle stops, the covering, the wrapper, twists together, it bundles together, and it makes this cord-like structure that we can connect into a bone. So that's what a tendon is, right? All when the muscle ends, all of these CT layers merge together and they form a tendon. And then that tendon inserts and attaches muscle to bone, right? Or it can connect to your skin or something else. Now, here's a new term that we haven't heard. We've heard tendon before, right? Connects muscle to bone. It's really just the CT layers of the muscle. Aponeurosis is a new term. And aponeurosis is a sheet, a flattened tendon. It's a sheet of a tendon. Okay, so it's a thin, flattened sheet of a tendon. And we'll talk about a couple of these in lab. We'll talk about the galea aponeurotica or your epicranial aponeurosis. And we'll also talk about your iliotibial tract. And these are two good examples of this aponeurosis, just a broad band of kind of tendon, right? Blood vessels and nerves. I just mentioned how important these are going to be. The blood vessels, we're going to have a lot of blood vessels, extensive blood vessels, because we need a lot of oxygen. We need a lot of nutrients. We need to get the waste out real quick. M again, muscles are highly metabolic. They like to do a lot of metabolism, so we have to give them their goods and take away their bads, right? Now, whenever we talk about nerves, we haven't done chapter 12 first. There's a lot of professors that prefer to do chapter 12 first because of the nervous system. I think that we this is a great way to introduce nervous system and then when we hit chapter 12 we're ready for it instead of kind of overwhelmed by it with this test, you know. So I do want you to understand though there's different nerves. You don't have to know them right now. There's sensory and there's motor nerves. Sensory nerves bring information in. Motor nerves take information out of the brain or spinal cord. So these nerves that control these muscles are types of motor neurons, okay? So the neurons that control it are called motor neurons. And now we need to learn some basics of a neuron, really. Okay, so this neuron, it's got its main cell body, and hanging off of the cell body, it's got these little tree, barren tree-like extensions. It looks like trees without leaves. They're called dendrites. What that does, it just increases the area of the cell body so we can have more connections, more synapses. And again, we're going to talk about all of this in, two, in our next chapter. The axon is a very long tail of this neuron, and the axon acts like a wire. So this is sending that action potential, that nervous impulse, down the neuron to the point where it can stimulate our muscle cell. The axon is going to reach through these connective tissue layers and eventually hit what we're going to call the neuromuscular junction. And this is important. We're going to hit this later. This is a very advanced concept, so just park that term for a minute. Now, skeletal muscles are voluntary. We can control it with our cerebral cortex, and so that means that this is a voluntary process. So we can think about it, and then this muscle is going to move. Here again is that image kind of demonstrating um, and showing you uh, all these different layers, the levels of muscle, fascicle, and individual cell or fiber. We also see endomycium, paramycium, and epimycium. But here we can also see when the muscle runs out, when it finishes, the wrappers merge together and they form the tendon that attaches onto that bone. Before we talk about uh, specific microanatomy of a skeletal muscle, let's just mention that these are one of our two main multinucleated cells, right? These are multinucleated. They have more than one nucleus. The reason why they have more than one nucleus, the first reason, the physical reason, is because as they were forming, there were embryonic muscle cells called myoblasts. Myoblasts are these embryonic muscle cells, and they end up fusing. When one fuses to another one, then they add a nucleus to that. And so however many myoblasts fuse, they each add a nucleus, and that's why the adult muscle cells are multinucleated. 
Okay. Now, why do they need these nuclei? They need these nuclei so that they can make more enzymes involved with the process of contractions. Okay. This is a very highly metabolic process. So we're going to need a lot of enzymes and a lot of other th chemicals that are coated by that DNA in order to run these processes. So we just need more DNA. Okay. We need more DNA and we need more DNA factories. And that way we can produce more of what we're looking for faster. Now, here's kind of a view that we see. Here's myoblasts. They're going to fuse together. We can see two fused here, three fused here, and now we're starting to get our adult cell, right? And so here's how we get all those multinucleations. So here we've got six total nuclei, so that means, or seven, so that means that it took seven myoblasts to form this adult um, muscle cell. There is a type of myoblast that never fuses, though, and we see that mentioned right here, satellite cells. So we definitely need to know this, myoblasts that are unfused. These guys are important for growth and repair. So I want you to know that these guys are important for growth and repair. Here it says maybe stimulated, differentiate if tissue is injured. So for repair, but also whenever you make your muscles larger, you're actually injuring them in order to build them bigger. And so these satellite cells are important for whenever you work out to build that muscle after you work out so it gets larger. But also if you damage a muscle in a bruise or something, these satellite cells kick in and help, help fix that. Now, let's really look at this microscopic anatomy. While we're looking at this microscopic anatomy, there is an image in your textbook, if you can find it. And here um, it says it's figure 10.3. I think it's still 10.3. It has a lot more of these tubes in it, though, in your edition of the textbook. This is from the last textbook. And so here now it's got a whole lot more of these myofibrils. That's what these guys are called, these myofibrils. There's a whole lot more of them. But as we go through, maybe have your book out and take a look at these and kind of relate the parts uh, as I go through it. Here is going to be our outer layer called the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is going to have these holes, and connected to those holes are these, per, are these green tubes called T-tubules or transverse tubules. So these guys are going to pass the action potential down into the inside of the cell. They're going to reach this group of three parts right here called a triad. It's one T-tubule, and on each side we've got a pocket called a terminal cisternae, and these terminal cisternae are going to store calcium. They are part of this network called the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the SR kind of sucks calcium out of the area around these myofibrils out of what's called the sarcoplasm and they suck it into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then they store it in the terminal cisternae. When the action potential reaches here it's going to zap the calcium out of these pockets and that's going to trigger our next stage. Eventually we want these fibers that are in here, we can see these myofilaments, we want these guys to interact and kind of play a game of tug of war. And so that's what we're aiming to do is to stimulate these and kind of get this game of tug of war going. Now let's kind of learn some of these parts again. Um, now that we've seen the image, let's start with sarcoplasm. Okay, the sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm inside the muscle cell. Okay, it's simply just cytoplasm inside of this cell. I want you to make a note that if calcium is ever released into the sarcoplasm, if calcium is ever released into the sarcoplasm, then we will get a contraction. Okay, so if calcium is ever released into here, that's going to trigger our next step in the contraction. It's going to cause a contraction. Now, as I mentioned, the sarcolemma or sarcolemma, this is the muscle cell membrane. So nothing fancy. It's just the cell membrane of the muscle. And we saw those green tubes that took kind of the stimulation from the outer area on the sarcolemma down to the inside of that muscle cell. And those tubes are called T-tubules or transverse tubules because they're going transverse or they're going perpendicular to the membrane. They head to the inside. <coughs> Sorry about that. I want you to note these T-tubules that they wrap around myofibrils. Right now, the whole key to the sarcolemma and the T tubules, these are carrying the action potential. Here is where we can become excitable, 
and also we can be conductive is on the sarcolemma. This is kind of how we share that electricity. We don't use wires once we get down to this point. We use the outer membrane as the wire. And if we have these tubes that are connected to that outer membrane, just invaginations of the sarcolemma, then that's going to travel the AP to the inside of the cell and kind of surround these myofibrils. Now, these guys, don't, let's don't worry about sodium potassium pumps right now. I'll talk about this, but if we ever see these, that means that they're excitable and conductive. That's all that that is, so let's skip it for right now. Okay. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Again, this is that purple network that I pointed out. The sarcoplasmic reticulum wraps around our little, our little bundles of, of myofilaments called myofibrils. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is trying to suck the calcium. It's pumping the calcium out of the sarcoplasm and putting it into these little pockets. These little pockets of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are called terminal cisternae. Instead of pocket, they use the term blind sac, right? A terminal cisternae, at the end, there's a cistern, there's a pocket, right? This is where we store calcium. And again, in that image, I pointed out how here's one T-tubule plus two terminal cisternae. That gives us a group of three things called a triad. So I definitely want you to write that down, a triad, one T-tubule, and a terminal cisternae on each side. So that gives us three parts. Now the function of that triad is super important. A triad, you need to know, is where the AP, the action potential, causes calcium release, right? Here's how we release the calcium into the sarcoplasm. And as I said before, if we release the calcium into the sarcoplasm, that's going to trigger our next stages of the contraction. And so here we see the AP coming down sarcolemma, down the T-tubules. When it reaches the triad, it zaps the calcium out of the terminal cisternae, and now we can start to get our next stages. As I keep using this term, myofibrils, these are these long cylinders that are on the inside of a muscle cell. And these myofibrils are made up of myofilaments. So the myofibrils are made up of myofilaments, and it's the myofilaments that interact to cause the contraction. So you definitely need to know that. The myofilaments are what interact to cause the contraction. They're going to play a game of tug-of-war. Right? We've got two filaments. We've got thick and we've got thin filaments. I want you to go ahead and understand that the thick filaments are going to act like hands and the thin filament is going to act like the rope. So in order to get a contraction, we're going to kind of play this game of tug of war. We're going to use the thick to pull on the thin and that's going to create the tension that produces movement. Right. So these myofilaments, these are tiny little protein bundles or protein filaments, and these guys create our myofibrils, and they are what's responsible for our actual contraction. Now we're going to add another term in there, okay? We're going to add another term, and I want you to go ahead and add it, and then we'll talk about it here in just a second. We see that term right here. The term is sarcomere. If you haven't figured it out yet, the prefix sarco refers to muscle. Right, so sarcomere, what this is, this is a functional unit. This is the functional unit of the muscle. So that's our first definition, functional unit of muscle. But also what it is, it's a repeating collection of myofilaments. It's a repeating collection. We see a Z line and a Z line. We see these zigzag lines. Here's another one. So in between each of these zigzag lines, we got one sarcomere, but they repeat. Right here, we see another one forming going into that cell. Here's another one coming out of that cell, right? So these are repeating units. So basically, myofibrils are made out of repeating sarcomeres, and sarcomeres are made out of myofilaments. So it's still the same concept that we had just a second ago. Myofibrils are made of myofilaments, but myofibrils are also made of sarcomeres, and sarcomeres are made of myofilaments. And all the sarcomeres is just a specific arrangement of these myofilaments, and then it repeats. And as it repeats, it creates the myofibril. Okay, so we're going to talk more about that sarcomere here in just a second. 
Let's talk about thick versus thin filaments. Our thick filaments contain what we call myosin. This is one of the proteins that we eat when we eat meat. We eat myosin, right? Because muscle is meat. So these are the thick filaments. I want you to understand that myosin looks like two golf clubs wrapped around each other. Here's one myosin, right? I want you to make a note that it has a head and it has a tail, right? The tails bundle together and the heads are what grab the other filament and cause the contraction. So when we look at these heads, I want you to add a little note that the heads have two different binding sites and we see these mentioned. The head has an actin binding site. This is where it grabs a hold of the other filament, the actin molecule of the thin filament. And so here, if you think about it being a hand, the actin binding site is your palm and the inside of your fingers. That's the only place that you can grab something. You can't grab it with the back of your hand, only the inside, right? So there is the actin binding site. But it also has another binding site for ATP. You don't have to put ATPase. So just put ATP binding site. This is where we use energy. We're going to give this ATP, and it's going to cause this head to start pivoting. If you take your hand and make a fist and put it out to the side of your wrist and start pivoting up and down, that's what that head does. Your arm is kind of like the tail, and your hand is kind of like that head, and it just pivots up and down. If it grabs and then pivots, then it's going to cause a contraction. It's going to be playing tug of war. Right, so let's go back and let's relook, make sure that we covered everything under thick filaments. We've got myosin. Myosin has um, heads and tails. The tails kind of bind together, and here it says intertwined. Right, the tails pointing towards center, so the tails get bundled together and the heads stick out around the edge. The heads are what actually bind to the actin with that binding site, and then they use ATP to cause the pivot, to cause the actual tension, the contraction. Now, let's talk about those thin filaments. Again, the thin filament is going to act like the rope, and the thin filament are made up of two strands of actin. Now, when we look at actin, I'm going to go back over here to the image. When we look at actin, we can see these two strands. Each of these strands look like a beaded kind of strand that's twisted around the other one. Each one of these beads, I want you to know, is called a G-actin. So each bead is called G-actin. That stands for globular. Okay, It's just one little glob. When we put all these G-actins together, we get a chain of F-actin. F-actin, the F stands for filamentous, and so it's supposed to look more like a filament, right? And that's what we call it is a microfilament. So F-actin is the whole beaded strand. Now I want you to notice on every G-actin, we've got this black spot, this dark spot on it. This is the myosin binding site. So definitely make a note, each G-actin has a myosin binding site. And this is where the head of myosin binds with its actin binding site. So these two are going to meet up right? This is the hand, and this is the only place on the rope that you can grab it, okay? And so each G-actin has a myosin binding site, but what we see is that we've got these two molecules. We've got this one called troponin, and then we've got this one called tropomyosin, the one that almost looks like green twizzlers. You notice the green twizzlers are covering the myosin binding sites. Tropomyosin's job is to normally cover these myosin binding sites. And the key is, if this binding site is ever, ever, ever exposed, then myosin will always grab it. And as long as myosin has ATP, as long as you're breathing, then you will pivot and cause a contraction. Okay? Now, this tropomyosin is usually covering that myosin binding site. And in order to get him to uncover we have to give something to his buddy troponin. His buddy troponin is kind of in charge of him. If we give troponin calcium, it has a calcium binding site. So I definitely want you to make that note. Troponin has a calcium binding site. If we give it calcium, it pulls tropomyosin off of those myosin binding sites, and then the heads of myosin all grab a hold and start to pull. And that is our contraction. Head of myosin pulling on actin, 
equals true contraction, right? We've got all these steps that lead to it, but the actual process that forces movement and creates tension is myosin head pulling on actin at the myosin bonding site. Okay, now let's go back. Let's make sure. Here are these thin filaments again. Thin filaments, we've got our G actin, and each G actin has a myosin binding site. We form them all together to make that filamentous actin, that F actin. And then we have our tropomyosin and our troponin. Tropomyosin is normally covering the myosin binding sites. But again, remember we said that if there's calcium in the sarcoplasm, it triggers the contraction. And here's why. If we release calcium there at those triads, remember the T-tubule and the terminal cisternae, if we release calcium from the triads, it binds to this structure here, troponin. And calcium binding to troponin is going to move tropomyosin off of those bonding sites and now uncover them. And that's the key, giving calcium uncovers binding sites and that causes the contraction because that myosin head is always going to attach and start to pull. Okay, so there's our images again. Again, you folks like to be visual learners, so use as much visuals as you can so that you can be as successful as possible in this chapter. Next, let's talk about those sarcomeres. Okay, again, don't forget that myofibrils are made up of repeating units called sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are a specific arrangement of myofilaments. Okay, so it just kind of fits into our organization right there in between the myofibrils and myofilaments. These guys, we might have 10,000 of these linked back to back to back, and that's really what is going to create that myofibril. And the myofibril is going to run the entire length of that whole muscle cell. And again, the muscle cell is running the whole length of the muscle. So if we can shorten the myofibrils by shortening each sarcomere, then we can create a contraction and we can create movement. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get each one of these sarcomeres to shorten just a little bit. And because each myofibril is made up of thousands of these, then we're going to get a bigger overall movement. Okay, so make sure that you understand that. Shortening a sarcomere is what is happening during a contraction. Okay, now... These guys, sarcomeres, we've got some areas where we have these thick and thin filaments overlapping, and we've got some areas where we just have thin filaments, right? So we're going to talk about those. But the first thing we want to identify is called the Z-line or the Z-disc. I still call it Z-line. This textbook calls it Z-disc. But the Z-line or the Z-disc, this is that kind of zigzag line. I pointed it out just a second ago. In our image here, we can kind of see that Z line, that zigzag line and in that image. And so in between two Z lines is one sarcomere. So realize that, that a sarcomere is kind of defined by its Z disc or Z line. Okay, a sarcomere is from one Z line to the next. That's kind of the way you can think about it. Now, when we look at this, and again, I'm going to come back over here and show you a different image. Here we can see multiple sarcomeres lined up together. When we look at this, we kind of see areas where it's a little bit lighter, and there's that Z line in the middle. And then we see areas that's a little bit darker, right? And so we call these the I band for the light region and the A band for the dark region, okay? When we look at the I band, the I band, again, it stands for light, the I and light. So the I band is where it's lighter. But the I band only contains thin filaments. So this is where we just have thin filaments. Now, the key feature to the I band is right in the middle of the I band. And so that means that each sarcomere has I bands on each side of it. But right in the middle of the, of the I band, we have the Z line or the Z disc. Here it says it's bisected by the Z disc, right? And so right in the middle of that I band, we're going to have the Z line. And that's what we see. Here is an I band. And right in the middle is that Z line. There's an I band and there's that Z disc or Z line. Okay. Now, the A band is the other region. The A band is where we see thick filaments, right? But 
the A band is not just thick filaments. It's thick filaments, and it's also got some areas of thin filaments. And I want you to know that that's the key feature to the A band. It doesn't tell us here, and I hate this textbook for that, but it doesn't tell us. I want you to know that this is called the zone of overlap where we have both thick and thin filaments. The key feature of the A-band is called the zone of overlap. And this is simply where there's both thick and thin, and they're overlapping each other, right? Make sure that you understand the zone of overlap is where the contraction actually happens, right? This is where we can play tug of war. This is where we've got actin and myosin side by side. So as a result, this zone of overlap at the A-band is super duper important. This is where the contraction truly happens. This is where the myosin head grabs the actin at that myosin binding site and then causes that actual contraction. Now again, we kind of see that this goes light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, right? And because of that, because of these sarcomeres and that rotating pattern, that alternating pattern, this creates striations. So I want you to know that this creates the striations. So this um, pattern, this alternating light and dark regions, I-band, A-band, creates our striations that this skeletal muscle is fairly well known for. And if you, the farther back from this picture you get, the more striated it looks, right? The more um, kind of bold light, bold light, right? And so it kind of shows you that. Now here's a better picture, right? Here's taking our microscopic view and putting them together. Here is the Z line, here is the Z line or Z disc. So this is our sarcomere in between it. Here we have all of our thick filaments. So that area is our A band. And again, we kind of split the I band with the other sarcomere. So here is our I band. I band is nothing but thin and A band has all of the thick, but also the A band has this region right here and it's not labeled and you need to label it. This is the most important region where we have thick and thin filaments. This is our zone of overlap. Right, so there's our zone of overlap. Here's another zone of overlap. This is where those hands can grab the rope and pull. The myosin head can grab that actin at the myosin binding site and cause that power stroke, okay, cause that contraction. Now, here, let's move past that. I don't care about that, okay? That's just another view of a sarcomere, but I don't like discussing that. That's confusing. Let's talk real quick about the mitochondria. Okay, so there's a lot of mitochondria in here, so I definitely want you to know that. There's abundant mitochondria, and the mitochondria is good for ATP production, right? If we are going to use a lot of energy here in these muscles, then we need to produce a lot of ATP. And so this mitochondria is going to be super important for producing that ATP, okay? Now, um... We're going to talk about energy usage here in just a second. So we'll talk about this creatine phosphate. This is actually misspelled. That should be creatine phosphate, not creatinine. Creatinine is the byproduct. It's the waste product. And creatine phosphate is the actual um, high energy molecule. So we'll talk about this here in just a second. While we're here, though, what I want you to understand is we've got this mitochondria. We've got a lot of it. But we also need to store the two raw materials that create energy, that create ATP, and that's glucose and oxygen. So I want you to know that we store a lot of glycogen, and glycogen is just stored glucose, right? So in the muscle, we have a lot of glycogen, and that's stored glucose. We'll talk about this creatine phosphate later, how it can recharge our ATP. But we also have myoglobin, okay? Myoglobin, it sounds like hemoglobin because it's similar to hemoglobin. Myoglobin carries ox, extra oxygen. So it holds extra oxygen in the muscle. And that way, instead of hitting anaerobic, we can stay in aerobic activity. More oxygen enhances aerobic. And once we hit anaerobic, we start to make what's called lactic acid. And lactic acid starts to build up and it makes us sore and it makes us tired. And so we try to avoid lactic acid or lactate production. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we've got the sugars and the oxygen to keep everything flowing, okay, especially that oxygen. Now, 
Let's mention a motor unit real quick. We've kind of talked about this motor neuron and how it stimulates this muscle cell. But what I, what I want you to understand is that one motor neuron tends to stimulate a lot of muscle cells. It's not just one muscle cell. It tends to be a collection of them. And so that motor neuron plus all the fibers it controls is one motor unit. Okay, so motor units are what our muscles are made out of. So make sure to understand that. Our muscles are made out of multiple motor units. Okay, our muscles are made out of multiple motor units. Now, we can have a small motor unit or we can have a large motor unit. I want you to understand that the smaller the motor unit, the more precise control we have. So if we have muscles that have more motor units in it, we can have more control, excuse me, if we have muscles, the muscle itself is smaller and it has less motor units overall, it's got very small motor units, not very many muscle fibers at all, then we can do a lot more control with those muscles. Muscles of the eyeball are a good example, right? We can have very finite movement of our eyeball, try to move it in every possible direction and in every direction in between those, and you can do it. But large motor units, we have less control. So trying to lift your arm, that's big motor units. And so we just get this overall lifting motion. We don't get quite as much articulated motion as we do with a smaller motor unit. So again, small motor unit, more finer control, larger motor unit, less precise control. Okay. Now, motor units, again, are all throughout our muscles and they are... Um, uh, stimulate, stimulation producing weak contractions over a wide area, but the whole key is, and, and I haven't talked about this yet, and we need to add it right here, that whenever you have a muscular contraction, that you only stimulate some of the motor units in that muscle. Okay, so when we contract a muscle, we're not contracting all motor units in that muscle. All right, we're contracting just a percentage of them. Now, the more powerful the contraction, the more of these that we're going to trigger, but the problem is here that um, these motor units and their types of contractions, um, you, we, if we want to have a sustained contraction, then some of these motor units are going to start to get tired, right? So if we contract and we hold that contraction, we're trying to lift something and keep it lifted for as long as we can, that's a sustained contraction. So those motor units that are active are going to start to get tired. So I want you to realize this. During a sustained contraction, groups of motor units come off and on. So they kind of rotate. Some are on and the other ones are resting. And as those that were on start to rotate off and start to rest, then they're going to, another motor unit's going to come on, one that was resting. So for a sustained contraction, we still don't trigger all the motor units. We're triggering a group of them, but they rotate which ones are being triggered so it can keep that type of tension maintained on that area the entire time. Okay. Now we're about to get into the nitty gritty coming up and really kind of putting all this together. And so um, I want you, before we move forward, I want us to kind of take a note because what we're coming into next is the neuromuscular junction. And when we talk about the neuromuscular junction, I just want to go ahead and put it all together. Okay. Um, so um, let's start this whole neuromuscular junction discussion by talking about this. Let's start with this overview of the events in the skeletal muscle contraction. Okay, so overview of events in the skeletal muscle contraction. There are three major groups of events in this process, and we see them listed here. The first group we're going to call the NMJ, the neuromuscular junction. This is where the nervous system stimulates the muscle. So the first set of steps we're going to have is the neuromuscular junction. The second set of steps is what we've just described, basically learning the microanatomy. We're going to have what's called excitation, contraction, coupling. Excitation, contraction, coupling is the name of the second step. Basically what this is, is AP triggering calcium release. When the AP hits the sarcolemma, it goes down the T-tubules, it hits the triad, and it causes the calcium to be released. When that calcium is released, 
it's going to bind to troponin tropomyosin and we're going to start to uncover those myosin binding sites. This is going to start to trigger our third group of steps called the cross bridge cycling. This is also referred to as sliding filament theory. Old school we called it sliding filament. In this textbook they're kind of changing the name and calling it cross bridge cycling. So this is the actual process where the myosin head grabs and pivots, grabs and pulls on the actin molecule. Now, I want us to go ahead and write down 15 steps. We're going to do five steps for each of these three um, groups. Okay, so five for each three groups gives us a total of 15. Now, the number five for the previous one will become number one for the next one. You'll see what I'm saying here in just a second. So let's start with the neuromuscular junction. Okay, neuromuscular junction. The key here is the first step is AP on motor neuron. The AP is on the motor neuron, okay, and that's this motor neuron right here, okay. The next step is we're going to reach this expanded area right here, and this is called the synaptic knob, okay. So at the synap after the APs on the motor neuron, the AP reaches the synaptic knob. So step two, AP on synaptic knob. Step three, AP causes acetylcholine, ACH. We see it abbreviated right there and we see it written right here, acetylcholine or ACH. So step three is the AP causes acetylcholine release. Okay, so it causes acetylcholine to be released out of the neuron. Here we can kind of see this red. Here's acetylcholine being released. Now, the, the next step is um, acetylcholine or ACH across synapse. So the acetylcholine crosses the synapse in step four. And in step five, ACH, acetylcholine, binds to this part specifically on the muscle cell. This part is called the motor end plate. So this is referred to as the motor end plate. Now I'll back up and show you that. So step five, ACH binds to motor end plate and creates a new AP on sarcolemma. Okay, so with our neuromuscular junction steps, we've got five. We have an AP on the motor neuron, then we have an AP on the synaptic knob, then we have an AP that causes acetylcholine release, the next step is acetylcholine crosses the synapse, and our last step is acetylcholine binds the motor end plate and begins a new AP. Then that leads us into our second group of steps, excitation contraction coupling. So let's start with that previous ending. Step one for excitation contraction coupling is AP on sarcolemma. Okay, so we put the AP on the sarcolemma and that's just the results of what we ended up with at the end of the neuromuscular junction. We said that acetylcholine bound to the motor end plate and it causes a new AP on the sarcolemma. Now the first step for excitation contraction is the AP on the sarcolemma. The second step is AP down T-tubules. Okay, so the AP goes down the T-tubules. The third step is right here, AP at triad. Okay, when we hit this T-tubule with its terminal cisternae, we have AP at triad. Okay, and then we have step four. Step four, calcium release from triad or from that terminal cisternae. Right, so step four after the APs at the triad, which was step three, step four was calcium is released from triad. Now don't forget, the calcium is released into the sarcoplasm, we're going to get a contraction. Okay, so th the fifth step in this process is calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin, and uncovers myosin 
binding sites. Okay, so again, step five, calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin, and uncovers the myosin binding sites. So that's how we're going to start our next stage, right? So again, our five steps for excitation contraction coupling, AP on sarcolemma, AP down T-tubules, AP at triad, um, calcium released from triad, and then the calcium is going to bind to troponin tropomyosin and uncover the myosin binding sites. Now the next set of steps are called cross bridge cycling. In the cross bridge cycling process this is when the myosin is actually going to grab a hold of the actin and cause the contraction. I'm going to flip to the page here that actually demonstrates that. We're going to get our we're going to get our um our stage names from this. Okay, so step one in cross bridge cycling is the same as our step five. So let's reiterate calcium binds to troponin tropomyosin and uncovers myosin binding sites. So that is step one again, same as our last step five. Calcium binds at troponin tropomyosin and uncovers the myosin binding sites. And that's what we see right here. They're calling it 3A. Right. Instead of giving it um, one, two, three, um, you know, three is our big step. So then we're going to go A, B, C. OK, so first was the calcium binding at troponin tropomyosin, uncovering myosin binding sites. The next thing that's going to happen, step two, is cross bridge formation. Now, let's define what a cross bridge is. A cross bridge is simply just when myosin binds to actin. So when the myosin head grabs a hold of those G-actin molecules at that myosin binding site, we have a cross bridge formed. Now the third step is what we've been trying to get this entire time, and that's called the power stroke. So put some stars around that, right? Put some asterisks around that one. The power stroke is the actual contraction. After we form the cross bridge, we use the ATP, we use the energy to pull, okay? So the power stroke, our third step under cross bridge cycling, is the true contraction. That's what we've been going for this whole time, right? So now what we've got to do is reset so we can do it again. Okay, so after the power stroke, step three, step four is release of myosin head and ATP binds. Okay, so number four, we can say myosin head detaches and ATP recharges. Okay, so that's a good way to think about it. Well, first, let's just do this. Step four, my bad. Myosin head detaches, and then we'll use step five. Okay, so then we'll say step five, ATP recharges myosin head, right? And now that we're in this cycle, we just go right back over to step one with the uncovered myosin binding sites, and then we do our cross bridge formation again. And finally, our power stroke, then our myosin head detaches again, and we recharge it, right? So we're going to recharge um, the myosin head with the ATP so it's ready to go again, all right? Now, those are 15 steps. That's really kind of the complicated part of this chapter, okay? So this is really the difficult stuff. Now, let's go back and let's learn a few things dealing with this, these three big cycles. Again, our first big cycle is called neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction, again, is simply where the neuron is going to stimulate the um, muscle cell. And so this is what we just talked about with that motor neuron with its synaptic knob and that thing called a motor end plate. So let's learn these terms again. The synaptic knob. The synaptic knob is the expanded end of the axon. Now the reason that we care about this is in the synaptic knob we have what's referred to as synaptic vesicles. Don't forget a vesicle is just a bubble full of something. Well this vesicle is full of this something. It's full of acetylcholine, ACH. I'm always going to call it acetylcholine or ACH. A lot of times I like to call it ACH just to kind of short circuit that long name. Make it so you can write something faster in your notes. This is the neurotransmitter. 
Okay, so this is a neurotransmitter, a chemical made and released by those neurons that's going to stimulate their target cell. What I want you to know about this process, the synaptic knob, is that the synaptic vesicles contain the acetylcholine. And in the long run, what we're going to see is that an AP at the synaptic knob is going to release that acetylcholine. That acetylcholine travels across what's called the synapse or the synaptic cleft. So the synaptic cleft is a little fluid filled space between the synaptic knob and the target, the motor end plate. So between the synaptic knob and the motor end plate, we have this little space. And of course, we don't have air pockets in our body. We've got fluid filled spaces. And so this space is where the acetylcholine crosses. And then it binds to the motor end plate. And the motor end plate is simply just a specific part of the sarcolemma with acetylcholine receptor. So the motor end plate is where we bind acetylcholine, and that starts our new AP. Okay? Here's kind of a view. Here is a motor neuron. This motor neuron has three. It's a small motor unit, so we see it splitting to kind of stimulate three cells at the same time. Here we can see its synaptic knob, and here we've blown it up. On the inside of that synaptic knob, we can see the synaptic vesicles full of the acetylcholine. When the action potential reaches here, it's going to cause those to be released. And when they're released, they're going to travel across this space. Here's our synaptic cleft. And it's going to bind here at this invaginated region, and that usually indicates that's the motor end plate. And this is really important, this motor end plate, because this is actually where we have receptors. Here's the receptors. We see acetylcholine. It's being merged to the outside and spit out. Here is the acetylcholine. It's going to travel over here to the motor end plate. It's going to bind to the receptors, and it opens up channels. And these channels are going to allow sodium to come in, and that's going to create our new action potential. Okay? Now, as we mentioned, we're going to see... Um, tension created during these contractions. Here's what I've already showed you again, right? So here's that neuromuscular junction, AP down motor neuron, a synaptic knob. Uh, AP causes acetylcholine release, acetylcholine across synaptic cleft or across synapse. Last step was bind to motor end plate, create new AP. Then we're going to start our next group of steps, and this is simply just what we've already talked about, right? We're going to connect those parts we've already talked about, AP down sarcolemma, then down the T-tubule, Hits the triad, releases calcium, and the calcium is going to bind to troponin tropomyosin. And then that triggers our last group of steps, right, where we have the binding, and then we have cross-bridge cycling, and then we're going to have the power stroke, myosin head detaches, and then finally ATP recharges that myosin head. So I want you to know my 15 steps for the test, and if you can't put those 15 steps in order, you are going to miss 15 questions on the test. I'll tell you right now, you got to match these and these in order as to what happens first, what happens next, and eventually what happens last for each of these three groups of steps. So make sure that you are topped off on that knowledge, right? Don't just assume you know it. Now, here's what we've already mentioned. We've already talked about the neuromuscular junction. They're just going to hit it again and talk about this. I don't want to discuss the calcium entering the synaptic knob, so let's don't worry about that. We're just going to keep it simple right now since we're not really talking about um, neurons, and that's not really our focus. We will focus on that when we get to Chapter 12 and we talk about neurons. But for right now, all I want you to understand, AP at synaptic knob causes acetylcholine release. Okay, that acetylcholine crosses that synaptic cleft, it binds to the motor end plate, and now we're going to get our new action potential. Here again, we can see it. So here we see this acetylcholine binding, and then we're going to get a new excitation on that cell membrane, on that sarcolemma. The second group of events, again, is citation contraction coupling, and it does that. It links the AP to the calcium release that causes the contraction. Okay, so again, whenever we look at this, we're starting on sarcolemma. So we're starting at that motor end plate, and the motor end plate sends that, um, that uh, action potential onto the sarcolemma. It travels down the T-tubules. It reaches the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it forces that calcium to be released. And here's just kind of a view of that, right? Here's where we stimulated. They're showing all the 
channels. Don't worry about these channels. This is confusing. We haven't hit chapter 12 yet. But this is simply showing you that we're going to pass the AP with these channels, pass it down the T-tubule, and here we're going to zap this terminal cistern A, and here we can see calcium being zapped out of it. And none of our last step, calcium was released, and then it binds to troponin tropomyosin, right? And that starts our third group of events called cross-bridge cycling. Cross-bridge cycling, again, is the process where calcium binds, and then we're going to form our cross bridge. We're going to have our power stroke, and then we're going to detach the head and reset it with some ATP, give it some more energy so it can do its thing. Here again is where we kind of see what's happening in this process. Okay, now I want us to notice something that's happening to these sarcomeres. Okay, what's happening to the sarcomeres? Whenever we look at these sarcomeres, we're seeing that the sarcomere shortens during this process. Here's how its initial state will look. Here it's, is its contracted state. I want you to make a note about sarcomeres during a contraction. Okay, sarcomeres, Z lines get closer together, right? Here the Z lines are this far apart. Now they're a whole lot closer together, right? The Z line gets closer together. The other thing I want you to take a note about is the zone of overlap. Look at the zone of overlap here, right? Here's our air zone of overlap, and now look at this zone of overlap. So give yourself a note during contraction, zone of overlap increases in a sarcomere. That zone of overlap is going to increase in a sarcomere, okay? Now, this, what we've done so far in this presentation, super duper freaking important. This is most of the test, not most of it, but this is what I want to hammer the most on the test. I want to make sure that you truly understand all these complex stages, these steps. You understand your basic anatomy, your microanatomy, and how it all fits together to create this contraction. All right, so this really is kind of the most important stuff, what we've covered so far in the presentation. I want to hit just a couple of things here. As we mentioned, Z lines get closer together, zones of overlap gets larger, and that's during that action. Let me just mention real fast a couple of things dealing with muscle paralysis. Muscle paralysis tends to be where the muscles may contract and not relax, or they just may not be able to contract in the first place. Tetanus. Tetanus is a disorder, and we're going to talk about a process called tetany um, next class. Tetany is a sustained contraction. So let's go ahead and write that down. T-E-T-A-N-Y. T-E-T-A-N-Y. Tetany equals sustained contraction. Tetanus is when a toxin from a bacteria gets inside of your body and it causes tetany. Okay, so it causes tetany. So what it causes are muscles to lock up, right? Especially muscles to lock up in your jaw, right? So tetanus, muscles could lock up in your jaw and then you can't eat. Right, and so that's what causes lockjaw. Those most muscles are going to be overstimulated for a month, two months. So tetanus, stepping on a rusty nail, getting the toxin from that bacteria that lives in that rust in that soil, then is really going to cause some problems. And this is why we need to get that tetanus shot. Now the other type of analysis is botulism, right? And this is what people use to make Botox, which is about stupid, right? Botulism is food poisoning. This is a potentially fatal muscular paralysis. You could die of food poisoning if it's severe. So again, this is a toxin from another Clostridium bacteria, right? Clostridium botulinum. You don't have to necessarily know that. But botulism is food poisoning. It's toxin from a bacteria. And the big problem is, is it paralyzes muscles, right? Prevents them from releasing acetylcholine so they're passed. They can't do anything, right? Usually, this is caused from canned foods. If you didn't know that, botulism is more common in canned foods. And again, it has something a little bit to do with rust. If a, if a canned food is dented, then you cannot legally sell that can in a grocery store. You have to sell it in what's called a salvage store, at least in South Carolina, because dented cans cause food poisoning. So you should not ever eat from a dented can or give it to your dog if you use dog food like that. And so, um, you know, you have to get the temperatures high and kill the spores. So you got to make sure that you cook the snot out of it if you're going to eat some canned food that's been dented, right? And so, again, 
This has now been used. They figured out that this causes muscles to stop uh, moving. It causes paralysis. So now this is what they put in Botox, right? So this botulinum toxin that we talked about in the skin chapter, this toxin is injected for temporary diminishing wrinkles, right? But as I mentioned, if you keep doing this, keep injections going, eventually the muscle is con is constantly paralyzed. It never unparalyzes. You permanently paralyze that muscle. So then you lose that motion in the face especially, and you start to look like, you know, you're actually old then, you know, like Joan Rivers, how she just kind of, it didn't matter about the wrinkles. She just couldn't even move her face. That's even weirder than having wrinkles, right? So be careful with vanity, right? Just understand we all get older and we just grow old gracefully and we should enjoy it. And who cares what anybody thinks about us, you know? All right, guys, on that note, I hope that you enjoy your day. You don't think about what anybody else thinks about you. You don't care about it. You're going to go study. And you're going to enjoy your life, and you're going to do it the way that you want to do it, right? And so um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Here, again, is the more complicated information. So use this one to repeat this recording and repeat it over and over to make sure that you really got it because this, again, is going to be a lot of what's going to be on the test. All right, guys. Y'all have a great afternoon. Talk to you soon.